Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, starting a new book today, 1 Samuel. We're going to learn many things in Samuel. A big part of First and Second Samuel, which is one book, is we'll see the rise and fall of David. And even before that, we'll see Saul, who will be the first man king of Israel. And we'll get to that coming up pretty soon. But what we're going to start out with in chapter 1, we're going to see the conception and the birth of Samuel. You'll see in different places in the Word of God, as we'll also see in Samuel. But you'll have other witnesses in Acts chapter 13, about verse 20, as well as in Chronicles, that Samuel is a seer, meaning he's a prophet. And he's mentioned a couple times in the New Testament also. You see in Hebrews chapter 11, it speaks of his great faith, that Hebrews chapter 11, all about faith. And in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1, it says that it's when um, the people of Judah, the people of Israel, were just going completely against God. And uh, God says there that even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind could not be toward this people. And I mean, they just went so much in the way of wickedness. But that shows how great of an intercessor that Samuel was as well as Moses. And don't ever underestimate the power of intercessory prayer. It, it truly is so powerful. And so Samuel was an incredible intercessor. And then you see, I believe it's Psalm chapter 99, verse 6. Samuel is mentioned again with Moses, and he's also, it mentions Aaron, Moses, and Samuel there. And it says how they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord answered them. So Samuel truly was a very righteous man, a servant of our Heavenly Father. So let's get into 1 Samuel chapter 1. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for your written word, and in this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. And I want to mention also what we're going to see with Samuel is Samuel's basically going to be the last judge. Because you see, at this time, there wasn't a king. God wanted to be the king, and uh, which he is the true king, of course. But we'll see when we get to about chapter 8 that Israel, they wanted a man king that they could see. So Samuel, as well as you could say Samuel's sons, which Samuel's sons went in the way of wickedness, though. But they were basically the last judges that led up to the becoming a man king, which would be Saul. So Samuel, a judge and a prophet, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim. Now I want to mention this Ramathaim Zophim. It, it's believed by some and it's possible that this is the same place as Arimathea like Joseph of Arimathea. So that's possible, but we can't say that for sure. So of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jer Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. And Ephrathite being the location. And we know that for sure because in First Chronicles chapter 6, you find this genealogy picking up about verse 33. And you'll see that this family are Levites, and they are of, of Kohath, of Kohathites. There are three main Levitical lines, and this is um, the Kohath. So we do know Samuel is a Levite, and this is his seed line, of course. Verse 2. Now speaking of Elkanah, And he had two wives, the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children... But Hannah had no children, and we'll see that she was barren. And many very important births that took place in the Word of God began with that woman being barren. You'd have uh, Sarah, Abraham's wife, which through Abraham would come his seed line, numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea, through which the Messiah would be born. 
So you have Sarah, then you also have Rachel, which would be the mother of Benjamin and Joseph, two of the 12 patriarchs of the 12 tribes. You also have Samson's mother was barren, as well as Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mom was barren. And you might think about Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1, Sing, O barren. And that's even spiritual prophecy of those who refuse to take the false Christ as their spiritual husband. That's a different study for a different time. Okay, verse 3. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And Elkanah, this is going to be Samuel's father, to, to make that real clear if I hadn't already. But So Shiloh, like you see in Joshua chapter 18 verse 1 and Judges chapter 18 verse 31, this is where the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant is at. So this is where they would go up to worship the Lord. And you'd see in Deuteronomy chapter 16, about verse 16, that three times a year, all the males were to come to where the Ark of the Covenant was and to worship the Lord there. And that would be on Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So he's coming up to Shiloh. And it's interesting also, of course, Shiloh here is a place but in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, even Jesus Christ is called the name Shiloh. And Shiloh means peace or rest. And before Jesus Christ would come and be born in the flesh and be crucified and resurrected, there were many ceremonies and rituals that had to be taken place. And like I said, they had to go three times a year, and which that's a great thing anyway. But Jesus Christ became all those things. And we put our rest in Jesus Christ and all those ceremonies and rituals and annual sacrifices were nailed to the cross like you see in Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. And when even Christ would be speaking to a certain woman in the Gospel of John, he would say the time's coming where, this is me paraphrasing, but he's saying God can be worshipped anywhere. You don't have to just go to Jerusalem or a certain place, but and that time is now. And we can, you can serve God anytime, anywhere. And of, that, that gets it said. Okay, so continue in verse 3. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now we're really going to see when we get into chapter 2 that Hophni and Phinehas were wicked. I mean, taking, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll get there in the details, but they were just going completely the way of wickedness. And uh, so that makes it real clear. Just because someone's a priest or a preacher or something like that, that doesn't mean they're righteous. So you don't put your trust in any man. You put your trust in Almighty God and in His Word. And you don't believe anything a preacher says. You don't take their word for it. If they can't prove it in the Word of God, don't ever believe it. Verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. Now, these would be part of the peace offerings. You can read about this in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 11 through 18. And when they would give these offerings, um, some of, part of that offering would go to the Lord, but then they would get to keep some of the offering for a sacrificial meal that they could share with their uh, friends and family. And that would be a very close thing with our Heavenly Father. I mean, a very uh, precious thing. And so that's what this is talking about here when he gave the portions. Verse 5. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut her womb. And we're going to learn a lot from this. Verse 6. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And it would appear that this adversary is referring to the other wife, Penina, and, um, but also, don't ever forget the adversary. That's one of Satan's names. And just like Penina did here, I mean, she was probably jealous that Hannah was getting a bigger portion. So she thought, oh, I'll get back at Hannah. I'll make fun of her for not being able to have kids, you know. And so, but don't ever forget, like I said, Satan is the adversary. And he'll use any chance he gets to try to take you down, you know, try to make you feel bad about something put something in your way that caused problems, but you have power over Satan and all evil spirits through the name of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. So you don't have to put up with it. 
verse 17. I wanted to mention also, you see in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, how Rachel would be envious of Leah because she couldn't conceive as well at first. Verse 7. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. I mean, every, every year, Penina just kept provoking Hannah, making her feel bad. Therefore, she, Hannah, wept and did not eat. Couldn't even eat. It made her so sad. Verse 8. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? That, that's interesting. That's the same phrase that the two angels and Jesus Christ would say to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20 when, when she hadn't realized that Christ had resurrected yet, but she thought maybe his body had been taken or something like that. They said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? So continuing verse 8. And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not, am not I better to thee than ten sons? And he's kind of saying, am I not enough, you know? But, but I mean, you can, so she was probably very sad, and well, we, she was definitely very sad as we read, but, I mean, maybe just not even really talking to Elkan at all and kind of making him feel bad, and he was kind of like, am I not enough? But you'll see Elkanah had compassion and always be compassionate of your spouse and of their feelings and don't neglect your spouse or anything like that and be understanding of how they feel. And like I said, we'll see that Elkanah, he definitely, we already read, he loved Hannah much. So he was a compassionate, very good person to her. But she was very sad. Verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat up on a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. Eli is the high priest, and that word seat is kisei in the Hebrew, and it's many times it's translated as throne, but, but he is the high priest here, and have it seat translated there. Verse 10, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And that, that's what we do in, in hard times, and we're in a sad, rough spot, you go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. That's always what you do. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, it says, Be not careful, mean, and it means be not anxious in anything, but make your supplications, that means make your requests known to God. And it says there that the peace of God passes all understanding, and it truly does. Verse 11, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt, don't overlook that, we always pray in God's will, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. If thou wilt, indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head." So that no razor come upon his head, that shows that she is offering to the Lord that her son would be uh, under the vow of a Nazarite for life. And you can read about the vow of a Nazarite in um, Numbers chapter 6, where you find out that they will not drink any wine their whole life, no alcohol, and then not even to eat uh, raisins or grapes, nothing of the vine. And uh, that they are not to put a razor to their head the whole of their life. And they're also not to come in contact with the dead. That even if one of their family members died, they're not to go anywhere near that dead body. And what a Nazarite, that vow is all about, it's that you are separating yourself to the Lord. Separating yourself from ways of the world and you're dedicated to the Lord. That's what a vow of a Nazarite is. And she's saying, God, if you can just give me a son, I will, he will be dedicated to you for life. And um, also, I mentioned Samson before. Samson also would be under the vow of a Nazarite for life, as you would see in Judges chapter, I believe it's 13. And even John the Baptist, I mentioned him before too, John the Baptist would also be under the vow of a Nazarite. So we see these many connections here that is pretty interesting. Verse 12, And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. That means he, he saw, and we're going to read it, verse 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, meaning she, she's praying to God silently. 
God knows your thoughts. You don't need to speak it out loud in prayer. God knows your thoughts. So she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And I mean, he jumped to a conclusion big time, which was completely wrong. So don't, come, don't jump to conclusions. Don't go judging people, you know, because he was completely wrong. She was praying to our Heavenly Father, but her lips were moving, but she was praying silently. Verse 15, And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, speaking to Eli, the high priest, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. And before you see there, Lord, you have the capital letters, Yahweh. Of course, to Eli, it was just a small L, meaning just he, she's, he is her superior, is why he called, she called him Lord. But poured out my soul before the Lord. Once again, that's what we do in hard times. And never forget Psalm chapter 34, verse 17 and 18, which says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. That's a crushed spirit. So you call out to God, He answers, He hears, and He gives you that peace of mind and happiness, even in terrible times. Verse 16, Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. Belial means worthless or wicked, and it's, it's even a name of Satan, actually. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. It's interesting, I meant to already say it, but I'll say it now, that the very name Hannah, it means grace. And she will find grace in the sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And she had faith. She knows God hears her prayers. And once again, you always pray in God's will. But don't ever forget Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, which says, All things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And if you don't believe, yeah, don't expect it. But once again, I have to make it clear, you always pray in God's will. But when you're doing what is right... You're doing your best to serve God and you call out to Him in prayer and you ask for something in God's will. You know He's going to answer that prayer no matter what. And if it's, if it's His will that you have that, you're absolutely going to get it. But if it's not His will, He might have other plans for you. Then He might not allow you to ha have a certain thing. But make no mistake, He's always going to answer that prayer to the best of your benefit in the long run. Don't ever doubt that you have that faith. Verse 19, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And you always worship the Lord in the good times and even in the terrible times. Remember Job, what he went through in chapter 1 and 2 of Job? He still worshipped the Lord, Job chapter 1, verse 20, and he didn't curse God. And so what an cre incredible example Job set for that. So she, she, Elkanah knew his wife, and so she conceived. Verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And that's what Samuel means, asked of the Lord. El, that's one of God's names. And so Samuel asked of God. Her prayer completely answered. Verse 21. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. So we see there that uh, Elkanah, he had made a vow also. Verse 22. But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. 
tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. The Lord's word is always established. It's always true. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. It's possible that this one bullock was given to Eli uh, to consecrate Samuel to come into the service of the Lord in the tabernacle and that the other two uh, were um, just normal sacrifices as would usually happen. Now, I can't say that for 100% fact, but that's a pretty good chance. Verse 26, And she said, O oh, my Lord, speaking to Eli, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. She's saying, remember me, I'm the one about nine months ago or so that was, that was praying, that you thought I was drunk, but I was crying out to the Lord. So she's, what she's really doing here, giving glory to the Heavenly Father, that her prayer was answered. Verse 27, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Verse 28 is complete. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And of course, you know from Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls are gods anyway. But, but so she, did it. she made true to her vow. And uh, don't worry, we're going to see in the next chapter that God's going to bless her with, I believe it's five more children. So don't worry, she got super blessed, but she kept her vow, and that's very, very important. Don't ever forget Ecclesiastes chapter 5, about verse 5 and 6, where it tells you there, it's really a better idea to not even vow at all. Because it says, if you, if you vow something to God, you better make good on it. And it says, don't say before the angel, oh, it was an error. Don't try to say, oh, that's not really what I meant or something like that. No, God knows the hearts. Acts chapter 15, verse 8. If you make a vow, God knows, and it says God knows the hearts in Acts chapter 15, verse 8. But if you make a vow to God, God knows exactly what you meant. He knows exactly, so don't, do not go back on that. Like I said, it's better for you to not vow at all. It's what God said, not me. It's better to not vow at all than to vow and not pay. But she did make that vow. She's dedicating Samuel to the service of the Lord. That's an incredible thing. And once again, God's going to bless her abundantly with, with multiple more children. God truly does bless those who serve him. So next time we'll keep going and get into chapter 2. Well, like I said, we're going to see Hophni and Phinehas. They were priests, but they went the complete way of wickedness. Don't miss that. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. And we just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.